first of all, I guess we have the wrong date here. I don't know who put me yesterday. Um, so we're going to have sort of a two-part presentation today. I'm going to start by introducing how we can think about um, the climate impacts of machine learning and what machine learning can do to address climate change. And then Nicola is going to speak about um, this in an urban context. Um, all right, this is more sensitive than I expected. Um, so um, just to give some background um, on, on where the field has arrived currently. Um, so about three years ago, Nicola and I were part of writing a large overview paper um, titled Tackling Climate Change with Machine Learning, where we um, listed all the different ways that machine learning can play a role as a method for addressing climate change, both in mitigation and adaptation. And about um, three years ago as well, um, Emma Strubel and colleagues published a paper that, that illustrated how large the greenhouse gas emissions are from large um, natural language processing models. And um, these two papers got a lot of attention and they sort of, um, people started drawing like two, two different narratives. One was, AI is going to help us a lot in the fight against climate change. It's almost like a silver bullet. And the other narrative was um, it's really bad for the climate and machine learning has a huge carbon footprint. And just to illustrate, both of these papers were covered by um, the same author, um, Karen Howe at MIT Tech Review, that um, within two weeks, sort of drawing a completely different picture of what AI and uh, how AI and climate change are connected. And that sort of motivated us um, to get together and write a paper or think about how um, machine learning and climate change are connected more broadly. What's, what's the holistic picture of how these two um, areas interact? And um, another important question that one needs to ask um, themselves is actually, why is machine learning relevant for climate change aid at all? Like, why do we need to look at machine learning separately? And um, the main motivation um, from my side is that AI is a fast evolving technology and um, there is a lot of potential for it to affect things. Um, so it could be sort of a wild card in, in the fight against climate change. And, um, I brought a quote here by Andrew Eng, who's a um, professor for machine learning. And um, he here in this quote compares AI um, to electricity. And he says, um, just like electricity transformed almost everything a hundred years ago. Now he, ac he actually has a hard time thinking of an industry that um, AI won't transform in the next several years. And um, just to compare some data um, on the bottom, you see um, the private investments in AI by geographic area. Um, with the exception of China, you see a large increases um, from the, in the private sector in AI. So it's definitely a technology that people put a lot of hopes in. Um, so I already mentioned that um, we were motivated to write a paper that so it illustrates um, the full picture of how these two areas inter intersect. And um, I'm gonna dive into some of the findings from this paper. It was actually published this week. Um, so here's a little screenshot from the paper. So um, we present here an overall framework of how one can think about uh, machine learning and greenhouse gas emissions. And um, this is a framework that's um, based on how um, the community around information and communication technology thinks about greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so in particular, they compare the um, what we call compute related impacts here, uh, they call them direct impacts, and then um, what we call application impacts, um, they call indirect impacts. Um, so the compute related impacts here refer to um, the emissions from operating hardware and also for producing an end of life of hardware. And machine learning algorithms run on hardware. So um, they directly cause greenhouse gas emissions through that. Then um, the way machine learning algorithms are applied matters a lot for the 
um, greenhouse gas emissions. And um, you can apply them in various kinds of sectors, um, depending on the application. These are some are more mature, some are more in the idea stage, but um, machine learning is starting to be really deployed in, in, in various sectors. And here it can increase or decrease emissions, sort of what we show with the green and the red lines here. And then lastly, we also distinguish the system level impacts from applications. This is a rather artificial distinction, but it was important for us to also really indicate that there are these system level effects. And um, what we mean by that are rebound effects, are um, ways in which AI affects um, how a technology is competitive. So lock-in effects or past dependencies. Um, it's about how consumers, um, well, consumption and like, general consumption patterns, essentially, um, you can perceive that um, targeted advertising, for example, affects those and um, other effects like communication and education, for example. And what we say here also is that uh, um, those system level impacts are potentially the largest, but they're also at the same time the hardest to measure. The compute related impacts are those that we can measure pretty well but um, they are um, rather small in scope or um, well-contained in scope. So I wanted to talk a bit about each of these aspects. And um, one big motivation for looking at the compute-related impacts of AI is um, that AI models have been increasing in size drastically in the past years, um, especially those from what is called deep learning, so deep neural networks. Um, actually, what you see here, um, all kinds of deep neural networks, it's famously talked about language models, but um, games as well, speech, um, vision models, they all have incre increased drastically in size. But um, this doesn't, still doesn't tell us how and if those very large models are used in practice. Um, so what we did in our paper is um, show how to think about the overall emissions coming from machine learning. So ab abstracting a bit or um, not only looking at one single model and how the size increases, but also how often is this model used and what do people do with this model? Um, so if we have a look at this box called use phase here, um, we sort of illustrated this um, by in, in the row energy per run, we sort of illustrate that the development phase is the most energy intensive. So if you develop a um, neural network you often um, you train it thousands of times at times um, to find the best configuration with the best performance then um, if you have identified the best configuration um, training it um, takes still a more energy but already much less than development and then using it inference is the least energy yet at the same time in many applications you do inference the most. So um, you use the model up to a billion times a day. Um, you rather frequent or infrequently, depends on the application, retrain the model, and um, you rarely develop a model. So um, it turns out that in practice, often this inference phase is, from an energy perspective, um, the bigger chunk. So depending on the application, but for, for Google and for Facebook, for the biggest applications, the inference part is actually what consumes the most energy overall. Um, then you can, of course, also have a top-down view, and that's a, a still uncertain number, but um, one would be ultimately interested in understanding how much of ICT emissions actually comes from AI. And that's a number that we currently don't understand yet because, um, for example, data centers are not required to, to report these numbers. Okay, let's um, get to part B, which is the um, immediate application impacts. So um, we have covered in this paper a large number of different applications. And um, I just wanted to um, showcase four of these examples and you will hear more from Nicola later as well of how one can use AI or machine learning to address um, climate change. And the first one is um, predictive maintenance. Um, in this example, um, applied for a railway system. And um, by the help 
job of um, analyzing data, um, this railway system from Deutsche Bahn is actually able to predict um, which where maintenance is needed and, and tailor it much better. So overall, this leads to um, increased reliability and also reduced cost for maintenance. And if predictive maintenance is applied in this way in low carbon sectors, um, you actually um, help them to be competitive. So we all know that if trains run more in time, it's actually we are more likely to take them to shift away from cars. Another example is from basic research. Um, so researchers use machine learning to um, identify new promising experiments. And this can help them, for example, in designing better batteries. So um, this kind of fundamental battery research is still really important for climate change um, to bring costs down, especially and increase performance of batteries. And um, machine learning plays a big role in, in speeding up the experimental process. Um, there are also applications um, for climate change adaptation. So for example, um, people use data to predict um, low cost outbreaks in East Africa and therefore can also understand um, risk to food security better and faster. And then another example from the urban space is um, from the project infrared of the Austrian Institute of Technology. Um, and here they use machine learning to approximate a very computationally heavy simulation of wind flow in, in urban districts. And um, they speed this up considerably um, with machine learning. Now you can find solutions in seconds or even less than seconds, what before took hours. And um, with that, they can try out new different configurations of, of districts that they plan. So this is an um, overview of how uh, machine learning really comes in to address climate change. So on the left, you see the different roles of machine learning. I um, already mentioned some of these, um, creating new data, useful data from, from images, for example, that previously couldn't be used. I already talked about accelerated experimentation. Um, interacting with simulation models or approximating simulation as in the example of the urban wind flow. Um, then forecasting plays a big role, famously um, forecasting renewable energy production to integrate more renewables in the electricity grid um, and system operation and control, for example, in heating, cooling and ventilation applications in houses. And um, I already spoke about um, predictive maintenance as well. And this, of course, can be applied in different areas. So for better policy design, for R&D, um, for technologies, um, for designing systems such as the urban infrastructure, or for um, actual engineering system operations. So not, um, not only heating and cooling, but also transportation grids, for example, or the, or the electricity grid. And very importantly, um, all of these activities, of course, are um, generally can also be applied to, to hurt the climate. So, um, for example, you can use predictive maintenance in very emission intensive industries and, and therefore strengthen their competitiveness. Um, so this is really important to keep in mind that the applications, they really can go both ways. And um, for the system level impacts, I already mentioned that here we look at effects. So this is really vague, but, but important to think about. So um, potential effects um, from recommender systems, from targeted advertising that we don't really understand really well. Um, so AI is very heavily used in targeted advertising, and we don't know if that overall increases the consumption or increases the consumption of emissions intensive goods. Um, AI can interact with um, new technologies or create new technologies and um, thereby also locking in um, different technologies. So for example, autonomous vehicles may lead to um, people driving more. So actually the AI can directly ingrain individualized transportation in this way. Um, of course, famously rebound effects. Um, so if you reduce energy consumed, you also save money and that money can be spent. And often this is spent to actually um, <clears throat> cause emissions again. 
So, um, for example, if you if driving becomes more efficient, people move further away because they can afford it and they drive more. And then um, the last one is that perceivably there's also an effect on um, education and on communication, for example, um, climate opinions um, and social media can be affected through AI and, and that also plays a role for climate action. Okay, so um, how am I in time? Oh, I'm going quite long, but I'm almost done. So in this paper, we actually um, also put out a roadmap on, on what kind of research is needed in this area. Um, so we definitely need better best practices for energy efficient machine learning algorithms. Um, we also need to understand better what are the usage patterns of machine learning in practice to understand where. So, the idea is to rendre le, le, le where. Okay, I think somebody's unmuted. Um, exactly. So, so, we need to better understand where is machine learning going? Um, how is the energy use from, from the computational activities increasing? And. Um, Primarily also, we need to understand what's the overall emissions from machine learning computers, which is a data point that we currently don't have. Um, for understanding how beneficial machine learning applications are um, to the climate, one also needs to understand what is the marginal or the counterfactual benefits or what would be the alternative to using machine learning. And there, there are various different ways that one can think about it. it might be human decision making it might be just another algorithm um, so this is still an area where there's not really established methods um, for that we also need to better understand like what is the taxonomy of ml systems that are there and ultimately one would want to help stakeholders really assess the costs and benefits of a new uh, machine learning project before it's implemented and then for the last part, for the system level impacts, um, we want to be able to account for machine learning um, also in forecasting a scenario analysis of um, decarbonization pathways. And one could do that by trying to understand how machine learning affects efficiency, production consumption rates, learning rates of technologies, um, resource constraints, financial assumptions, et cetera, in these models. And um, for that one also really still needs to understand how digitalization might affect um, these pathways. And um, machine learning obviously also depends on the state of digitalization because um, it depends on data, um, computing infrastructure. So um, this is a, a first step that needs to be done as well. And um, just a quick pointer, we don't have time to really go into this, but. Um, we also put together policy recommendations of what um, governments can do to both foster um, new applications in the area of climate change and um, also for reducing the negative impacts of um, AI on the climate more generally. So this is all published in a report um, titled uh, climate change and AI recommendations for government action that we published together with the Center for AI and Climate and um, the Global Partnership on AI. So with that, I would like to hand over to Nicola and um, I will just keep sharing and, and you can tell me when to skip slides. Or maybe we can, you can just stop and I will share. Yeah, okay, we can also maybe do that. Just easier. Uh, so, sharing screen and now, uh, oops. That is not what I want to show. That's what I want to show. Perfect. Yeah, thanks, Lean. Um, yeah, I think that's a really super helpful uh, mental model um, that was just um, outlined here. And I really encourage everyone to look into the, the paper on which this uh, talk is based. It's, it's short, it's uh, not, not too technical language. It's very, um, very nice read uh and yeah as i guess uh people here are uh all urban experts and interested in cities uh i'm not going to talk about how to 
um, yeah, specifically use uh, AI in, in cities to tackle climate change. And I usually like to start my talks with this uh, image of Los Angeles um, to just frame a bit the, the, the big idea of how we're going to use AI to optimize those cities. And it's going to work within two days. But when you look at this image, <clears throat> It's such it 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 it's, it looks really apparent that it's such a huge challenge to um, find solution that we, you will apply to each single building. They are all so different, and there are so many of them, and you have so many interrelation between certain part of the city and others. So, um, how to conceptualize completely? Um, how to go about finding those uh, strategies that, that are going to be effective and that are going to reduce the huge emission of a city like Los Angeles uh, and which one are maybe not the best ones. So um, the, the first thing that we can look at <clears throat> is actually which data are we going to use to, to tackle this problem as AI um, heavily relies on data. And the good news is that we have more and more data on cities. So this is um, specifically the kind of data that I'm working with and I will uh, talk more about um, in this talk is the, the data on the building stock. Uh, and in, in general, the data about infrastructure. So we have no great geospatial data that enables to see um, at very detailed resolution the structure of a city, what different elements you have in a city. So uh, which building you have where, which streets, and all, all these things connect together. And that's one entry point to, to use AI application to try to optimize um, the structure of the city. And so, um, that's uh, yeah. This this talk is um, also a bit of opinionated in the sense that there are many different uh, interesting applications to um, to use machine learning in, uh, and AI in in cities. I'm actually going to focus on um, the role of AI to try to uh, help planning cities from an infra infrastructure perspective, um, because um, I'm going to explain in this talk why um, in in my team we we, we think this is a really um, uh, very impactful option. So the, um, the overall framing it follows a bit um, what uh, Lean outlined that there is an increasing focus on using digital uh, te technology in general for sustainability pathway and in cities. And we have um, uh, cities uh, as a key area where you can have positive and negative deployment of AI systems. So. Um, what we essentially, what kind of cities do we will get in the future? Is it the city, uh, the, the picture um, on, on the top where um, we use AI to um, figure out which, which are potential intervention where we can um, reduce energy use, improve livability of cities, or do we use AI to just um, create all sort of new gadget uh, technologies that will, uh, in the end, also create a lot of rebound effects and a lot of extra energy use. Um, so it's all about um, figuring out how we will use um, AI in a way that we make efficiency gain, but also how do we address the the, the problem of very rapidly in increasing demand for services uh, uh, in cities that are sometimes related to the new AI applications that are related to new services. And um, that's why um, actually the using AI for um, optimizing the infrastructure is really looking at um, not adding some new services, but really trying to reframe um, how we um, we use the city as a public good um, and the, the infrastructure that is provided by the city um, in a way that we reduce structurally emissions. So um, uh, in general, so this is just a quick overview of a bunch of potential um, options that uh, you can use AI for in cities. So uh, you have, in general, you can make this distinction between marginal and system-wide um, efficiency options. <clears throat> so the, the marginal uh, efficiency option will be looking at all of the single buildings that have been showing and trying to optimize this building, specifically its energy use. So it can reduce the energy use of a building from like essentially bringing that to zero percent and make a huge improvement, but this is just one building. And if you are going for this kind of solution, then you need to scale it to um, to the whole city. Um, and the other kind of approach is more like system-wide efficiency, where you're trying to um, look at uh, um, effects 
um, that will happen on, on some part of the system that connects um, different parts of the city. So for example, this is typically um, using AI to try to understand how to make urban developments where by deciding where you will put this new house, you will also have an impact not only on the energy use of this house, but also on how many distance, like how many kilometers, which distance people will have to drive to go to the to go to the city center. So we're trying to affect not only the building itself, but the building in relationship to the rest of the system. Um, and um, and so yeah, there are a lot of different um, options that are around. At the stage of early development, and that's also a key um, uh, a key aspects where where we need a lot of work because um, yeah a lot of these uh, um, uh, pieces of, of work are at the stage of academic uh, proof of concept. So it's a research paper um, that has been applying the solution to um, a few buildings or um, a neighborhood, but they most of them I haven't really been deployed. Uh, in real world. So, um, and most of these papers also lack um, a clear understanding of what's the pathway to impact, or are they going to scale this um, this approach? And and this is um, uh, some aspects that are really critical and that usually require some um, some deployment also in, in uh, partnership with the industry. So um, it's, uh, it's, it's something that's taking time um, and where there are also a lot of barriers that include um, getting access to appropriate data, legacy systems, connecting expertise. Uh, but that's, um, that's, that's a, a big, um, uh, in, in general, yeah, there are a lot of barriers to actually get to the potential that, that is claimed that, that AI is gonna um, really make cities more efficient. Another aspect that I was just mentioning is that um, a lot of the literature is focusing on marginal efficiency gain, and there's actually very little amount of um, policy relevant work that's really helping policymaker of a city um, try to, to um, decide are they gonna implement any new policies that's based on, on data. Um, so here is, for example, uh, uh, a literature review where we try to look at uh, all the different uh, applications that you had um, uh, for urban trans transportation. And we saw, for example, here that a lot of um, uh, the approaches that were here uh, were looking specifically at traffic optimization, uh, which is typically uh, an approach where you are trying to uh, just make marginal efficiency gains. So you're just trying to reduce congestion. Uh, and by this, reduce the energy use that's um, related to people just sitting in their car instead uh, of going through the road. But this is somehow quite, um, there's quite a limited potential here. And this is not so helpful for policymakers to understand how they should um, change their, um, their road network or do all sort of new, um, new policies for uh, road transportation. Um, yeah, so uh, there are some uh, some new, uh, initial initiatives that are showing the the market potential and how um, how to go to from from proof of concept to deployment, but this is um, still at a very early stage. So uh, back to my point that um, what about using AI for public good provision uh, to to achieve this this potential of, of AI for sustainable cities via urban planning? So why, why this hypothesis? First, because the idea would be here, as I said, that we want to uh, target absolute demand reduction. So we, we want to make sure that um, uh, we won't get rebound effects because we are creating uh, a service that's more efficient and then more people are going to use it. So this is typically the case of roads. You are making the road more efficient, then you will have more users. Um, and this is um, something that's, um, that's most likely a dead end. So um, you also want to uh, shape preferences of people um, via providing them um, a, a space that um, that will um, that, um, that that will give them uh, some um, how to say some. <clears throat> uh, um, 
that, that, that will make them more likely to choose one option over an, another because the conditions are more appropriate for it. So this is typically, typically the case of providing back infrastructure that's safe. And um, so as we could see, for example, in Paris during COVID, if you, um, by doing public good provision of safe and uh, high quality uh, bike infrastructure, then you will make people change from using um, an unsustainable mode of, of uh, traveling, which is car to uh, using bikes. And um, yeah, this, there are other um, uh, interesting aspects here, such as uh, making sure that you don't deploy uh, and develop um, infrastructure that's high carbon, like um, the road network that we've been developing over the last century. And uh, yeah, there's also some uh, data governance aspects. So a lot, a lot of um, I, uh, reasons why it could be interesting to use AI for urban planning. Um, but now going more concretely on how we can do that. So this is stuff that we do in my team. We've been doing uh, several proof of concepts here. Uh, there are three uh, main components and I'm gonna talk about two of them. So one is actually to make sure that we have all the data we need to um, be able to uh, conduct this research and de deploy the appropriate products. The second is to uh, um, try to study how urban form is related to sustainability outcomes. And the third one is to uh, do some predictive modeling to try to think about um, future different cities. I see that actually I should hurry up. Yes, that, 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 that's what I, I was going to, to say. Like, do you think that it was possible to do it in two or three minutes to keep time for the... Uh, yeah. Time? Yes? Okay. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to go very quickly about... So, data generation. Um, yeah, I'm going to skip this. So, here, essentially, what we did was to... Uh, yeah. Um, the, the idea here was to, to um, that we, we wanted to uh, improve data availability in Europe. And so we wanted to do some modeling to compare different cities all across Europe about their building stock to, um, to try to identify solutions that could uh, work across different cities. And we, so this is a map that shows all the different uh, data sets that we found. So there was not one uh, single data set that had all uh, buildings needed and in all data sets were all different. And so we use machine learning to essentially predict the, the missing uh, information that we had in one data set and that we didn't have in another data set. So here in this case, uh, for example, we predicted building heights. So what we did is that we uh, use different information about the urban form about the building and we use this to predict building heights so that in the end you can have for the whole data sets um, something that's really consistent and um and where that you can use for for modeling so this is um this is one application of um of ai to to use urban planning is actually to do what we call data generation so uh, producing data um, in cases where where you don't have it um, the second application is um, to actually use this data to try to figure out something uh, relevant for city planning. And uh, what we looked at here is, was um, how does urban form influence commute distances. And so um, this is super important, uh, for example, in the context of the 15 minute cities, where you want to make sure that uh, why should people travel from the other side of the city? Why they could actually, um, yeah, they could actually just um, have everything they need in their neighborhoods and travel less. And um, so you want to make sure that they have everything they need and you also want to understand why they travel a lot. So we did this analysis where uh, we looked at a lot of GPS data and urban form to try to understand what are the relationship between urban form and travel distances. And um, so we could um, come up with very precise estimates of, um, which are different drivers. So for example, distance to city center, average uh, income, commercial, like is the presence of a certain type of urban land use here and there as an impact. And we're also able to plot this on the map. And that's a map that you can then hand over to policymakers to try to understand what to change concretely. Um, so yeah, in two words, um, there are uh, opportunities to better factor in the, the outcome of special configuration in, in of cities and policy design uh, with, with machine uh, learning. Um, 
in, in the new geospatial data that we have. Uh, we can then come up with, uh, we can help policymakers deploy some uh, some ideas such as the 15 minute cities. And this, this can also not only be good for um, sustainability, but you can also uh, bring in some different aspects of um, that, that have to do with uh, with people and how livable and how um, fair cities are. Um, and um, yeah, I think I'll just stop here. And thank you very much. Thanks, really. Thanks a lot, Lynn and uh, Nicola. Uh, I know it's definitely not easy to do a, a short presentation for such a dense and fascinating topic. So really, thanks for for, for accepting uh, to do it. Um, well, now let, let's uh, let's start the Q and A session. If you have any questions you would like to ask uh, to Nicola or Lynn, feel free to uh, virtually uh, uh, raise your hand. Yes, Laminia. And don't forget to introduce yourself, yes, just before asking your, your question. Yes, can you hear me? So uh, my name is Flaminia. Uh, I work uh, as an ESG officer, so in the field of ESG in a real estate company in Belgium. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. It was uh, very interesting, uh, uh, technical, but still uh, the message was very clear. Uh, I have a more or less a sort of, yeah, I would say a curiosity in question. So, um, what we see, especially in the real estate, is that uh, uh, machine learning, uh, AI in general, is very much used at building level uh, to help, uh, first of all, monitoring consumption, both energy consumption and resource consumption, such as water consumption, um, and uh, helping optimizing it. Uh, and especially for water, for example, uh, monitoring whether there is a leakage, which is uh, very important because some leaks are visible, but some other leaks are not visible. So my question in is uh, this, considering that uh, AI and machine learning can help us detecting, for example, the leakage, so the excessive consumption, whether it's an, an energy consumption or a water consumption, still it requires a human action uh, in order to, uh, to cover this, uh, this uh, problem or say this issue. So how, do you, would you, I mean, do you have any insight on how to reconcile the, the combination of, or, or of these two? Because on the one side, for example, there are, uh, um, there are uh, strategies that can be implemented, for example, in the case of water, such as uh, uh, not only leak detection system, but leak prevention system, but these are not applicable to all the buildings. So this is, uh, maybe it's a, it's a bit uh, technical and very practical and there is not uh, uh, a lot of, it's very building based solution, but I think it's very interesting to understand also the, um, the how uh, AI and, uh, and uh, human action can actually be combined together for the, the most efficient pur purpose. Okay, maybe I can uh, <clears throat> start with this one. So um, I think it really depends on um, on the, the 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 current situation where in 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 which city you are, uh, which kind of building it is, um, and in particular what kind of data you have. So uh, in some certain cases you can go end to end and use control techniques that will um, control the, the the building and make sure that everything is is going right where you have all the perfect situation in place, but in many cases, you won't have all this data. And, um, or sometimes it's not relevant because it can also be a bit of over-engineering to put control systems everywhere, because it also comes with adding more sensors and adding, adding more compute and et cetera, um, and adding more on the inference um, graph that Lynn showed, uh, some, some more data points. <clears throat> so um, there's also a lot of, at least that's the work that um, that we are doing uh, of work where you um, try to, um, yeah, look a bit more with the planning uh, view and try to use the limited data that, that you have to just help. So not ask the, the, the technical um, system to do everything, but just to help humans to go fast to go faster instead of looking uh, one by one at all buildings you will um, try to predict with a certain probability that this building is more likely to 
require intervention and then you save time for whoever needs to make the intervention to first look at these buildings but still need to you still have a need of a human intervention in the end um so i think there there's really different kind of of um of ai application and system that rely more or less on on human action but in cases where um all the conditions are not here to go for end to end with a technical um, uh, automatized approach, then there are also a lot of room for AI application that just make people win a lot of time without uh, doing this end-to-end -end approach. Yeah, and maybe to add another aspect, um, in certain cases, the system could run by itself, but you want a human decision maker for ethical purposes or for security requirements. So. There's also a lot of work um, that looks at what, what does it mean to have, and they call it human in the loop. Um, so that, that might be a valuable keyword. So all this discussion about explainable AI really focuses on that, that the human in the end can understand how did the system make the decision? And do I agree with that? Yeah. Yeah, no, totally. I think, I think, uh both very useful insights. And uh, I think indeed the fact about speeding uh, human action is probably the, the key. Uh, and uh, I mean, my next question, but <laughs> just to leave it as a reflection, it would be just whether we can scale up this uh, uh, in terms of uh, building stock in a city, but for later. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hi, uh, thank you for, for the lecture. My name is Tanya. I'm doing a PhD in uh, TU Delft in the Netherlands. Um, I, I don't have any background in machine learning or AI, so um, explain this to me like I'm five. Um, so uh, I, I'm curious about uh, something you mentioned very briefly about AI and sort of scenarios. So the idea of maybe like AI predicting different scenarios I, I'm curious, you know, it made me start thinking about, um, you know, like the book Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, where like turns out Earth was just like a scenario, uh, you know, simulation to test uh, different things. I, I, like, what is, what is it like uh, now with AI? What are the possibilities? Like, is it possible to even, um, you know, uh, sort of predict something really complex like energy transition uh, using AI, like how, how can it sort of um, incorporate things that we would never expect like a pandemic or a war or, you know, how, how does that work? Um, yeah, that's my question. Thanks. Uh, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> no, I, I can just quickly say um, AI is, or machine learning is really bad at that. So I actually meant to do something else with scenarios, but it's a good it's a good thing you ask because I think especially with long term forecast where there are things like you said a pandemic for example that are often called non stationarities or you know stuff that makes the data change um, or the data generation process change essentially um, is really difficult for machine learning because machine learning learns from past data and um, new things that are fundamentally different from what it has seen before. It's just very, very bad at. So um, in long-term forecasting, machine learning is used in certain ways, but more in the back end or helping with the simulation, things like that. Like you wouldn't, you wouldn't let a machine learning system try to predict something um, like the energy transition. Um, what I meant there is that we should, if we are predicting things like the energy transition, incorporate what AI might do to the economy. So thinking about, and, and even more broadly, thinking about what digitalization does, because surprisingly, many of these scenarios actually don't even include digital technologies as a factor. Um, and that might change many aspects of what may happen, especially around technologies, but also around consumer preferences and so on. So um, incorporating those factors into long-term um, energy and climate forecasting would be important. Yeah, <clears throat> and to, uh, so I, yeah, I uh, completely agree with what was just said. 
and um, to provide some some more context and um, and ideas. So I think like in general in the quantitative uh, sustainability research community, like scenarios are something super important that has been used a lot, for example, for the IPCC. So we kind of know what's the carbon budget. We know that we essentially need to get decarbonize the economy. And so we are trying to uh, make different scenarios that correspond to different futures, just quantify what it's gonna look like in uh, in uh, concretely, so um, let's make a scenario that is super optimistic, one scenario that's super pessimistic, and try to figure out uh, how to go about this. And <clears throat> because of computational uh, and data bottleneck, before we were only able to do things that were pretty rough, and they were not necessarily super actionable for city planners or, in general, the stakeholders that need to make decisions. And I think one key aspect of machine learning here is not to use machine learning to make itself a prediction of how, what, what are things going to happen in uh, in a uh, thousand year, but rather to be a building part of um, some model to uh, try to bring, for example, the, the, um, the prediction that were done before at the continental level done to some, some smaller units um, so that, for example, you can do different scenarios about um, how this specific city is gonna look like. So I showed before that we have um, no data, special data about a bunch of cities. So for example, in Europe, we we, we have such data so we can try to um, predict what's going to be the evolution of the building stock just for 10 years, not something too crazy where there's gonna be a lot of things we don't know and we have no idea from the previous data, but just in the short term, trying to understand what would be the next steps and do relatively simple scenarios where you can also control the assumptions, but say that, um, let, let's say that we now want to uh, compare two different options, say um, retrofitting 10% of buildings or demolishing 10% of buildings and putting new ones instead. Let's just put them here because we have the data and we have techniques to forecast um, or, or, is, or is this going to impact the energy use? And so trying with, with simple scenarios, but simple enough that they're at least also useful for policymakers to concretely decide, or oh, should I go for plan A or plan B to, to modify my city? Okay, hi, so can you hear me? Yes, okay. Sorry, I have really bad internet connection and I'm also on a conference. So uh, I, I missed part of the, the lecture, but it's super interesting. Um, shortly to introduce myself, I'm a PhD student, agent-based modeling of urban health interventions. So it's the scenario modeling, but not using machine learning, but actually multi-agent systems and geographic lines. And indeed machine learning can be used to aid the simulation models like the calibration or some of the data preparation or yeah, data generation. Um, so my question actually uh, regards your definition of artificial intelligence, because so far I have understood uh, that you mostly talk about machine learning, but uh, in the Netherlands when, yeah, uh, for example, when you study artificial intelligence, you also uh, learn about um, more explicit type of models, like multi-agent system, but also, for example, symbolic artificial intelligence, like knowledge engineering. And that can, I mean, also help a little bit with the yeah, explainability of uh, the models and therefore like uh, having, uh, yeah, having everyone on board, being able to find consensus about do we try, so th that's really important in an urban political environment, for example, right? So um, that's a little bit my question. Do you, do you, when you talk about AI, do you talk about machine learning and change, or do you look at the other types of models? And uh, you know, what do you think their role is in uh, also taking, for example, climate change? I think um, we're mostly coming from the machine learning side, um, but we're well aware of the broader definition of AI. Um, so because of the rapid development of machine learning, I think that's a very interesting area to look at because there are a lot of new methods um, and it's really increasingly being used. Um, so we personally work with machine learning and in, in, in those reports, we mostly address machine learning so it's a, it's a little bit tricky because, of course, you don't want to offend anyone by using AI, but then many people need the term AI to 
use the term AI sort of mostly for machine learning. Um, yeah. Yeah, so our, our, term, our use of AI is a bit uh, in, imprecise. Indeed, it's a bit more machine learning, the stuff where we are expert in and therefore not really expert in stuff like the, the different other approaches that you mentioned. So cannot comment uh, very precisely on, on the, uh, the, the potential uh, we or I see uh, in them, but I am pretty sure, um, or at least I heard and saw some uh, some different application that that seemed pretty impactful also and pretty complementary uh, because for example in my work I also not only work with machine learning but sometimes also combine it with some engineering approach uh, physical based approach uh, when relevant so I think there's a lot of um, room for mixing different form of AIs that are machine learning based and non-machine learning based. Yeah, super interesting. I, I just want to say that yeah I think for example one advantage of the more explicit type of models is that they're data intensive. So you mentioned that actually that the bottleneck of lack of data uh, for applying certain uh, machine learning models. Um, but then there's other type of knowledge that is existing that could be made use of in order to still improve our decision making or to understand the scenarios, like all the other applications. So that's a little bit of uh, what I see also the role of the other types. Yeah, that's super interesting and um, look forward to reading the paper. Thanks. Hi, I have a very quick question, so I think you'll be able to get to it. Uh, my name is Dana Crusher. I'm, I'm just a guest for today, but um, I'm a data scientist at Uber. Um, and my question is uh, probably for Lynn. Um, so thinking about the, um, the emissions from computing resources, doesn't that uh, isn't that basically a direct function of the cleanliness of the grid? Like, won't that naturally sort of trend towards zero over time? Yes, um, but energy efficiency is always a really important factor because you won't quickly decarbonize. And even then, you want to minimize the amount of generation um, resources you have because ultimately you want to electrify everything, your transportation, um, heating, so ideally produce even electrofuels for industry and so on. So we will need to minimize energy consumption and electricity consumption as much as we can for that reason. But yeah, you're right. Um, it matters a lot what's the carbon factor essentially right now, especially. Um, th thanks, thanks. Okay, sorry, go ahead, no, go, go. Uh, I hope it's okay to ask one more. I'm just curious. It's more of a vague question. Um, so I'm a AI researcher at MIT. Um, I'm curious, uh, as these systems become more embedded, um, and ill, Ill understood, I think, um, how they, how they work. Um, I'm curious how they alter the interfaces with which we interact with the city. Um, and I'm curious if you guys thought about that. Um, and what that means, because you guys talked a lot about things that are underneath the hood, infrastructure, stuff that's meant to be a little invisible. I'm curious, what are the appropriate means of interaction and how does that work? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. So I think, again, it relates to different type of um, <clears throat> Uh, approaches that, that you can use machine learning for when you're talking about infrastructure, for example, in particular. So um, more working on stuff where we're not deploying machine learning uh, based system in the street that will have an interaction with people, uh, but more I'm using uh, machine learning to design some infrastructure that has nothing to do with AI concretely. So for example, to put a street here or to put a bike lane here. So here, I guess the interaction with people is ex ante. So when you are having your um, some some process with public participation, so that's also tried things we are trying to um, to de to develop. So um, to have workshops with uh, people because of course your AI system is going to optimize this and that, but it's not going to take into account all things that are relevant for for people to. Um, be happy where they are living and etc. So you will be missing stuff. And so your system here in this case is here to make some 
recommendations, but uh, won't be prescriptive in the sense that you you are sure that you're providing the best uh, the best option. And so we want to also be quite humble and uh, get some feedback from, from people in the design phase. Uh, when it comes to um, yeah, to systems that are um, uh, implemented directly on the street. Yeah, this is this is a bit less my expertise, um, but I guess this is also something that requires a lot of um, of involvement of people before and as in that it's um, some some top down system uh, some system deployment where you would be putting sensors or whatever kind of solution on the street without. Um, proper involvement of, of those people that would be living with the systems um, can easily be problematic. Cool, thanks for answering. Yeah, I just wanted to make a quick comment and probably, I mean, already one sees it in transportation because we interact so much more in public transportation with arrival times and optimization of the trip and so on. So I, it's a really interesting question if there are other areas that are gonna also create like new modes of interacting with the city and the information. Thank you. Maybe, maybe I would have a last question actually, if you have some time, uh, Nicola and Lynn. Yes, because you both talk about, talked about the importance of systemic change. And this is also something we, we saw a lot during previous lectures, for example, last week with, uh, with Hélène Chartier from, from C40. And I was wondering if you, if, you, if you had other examples that you could share uh, where AI can be used to uh, is to facilitate this systemic change. So, Nicola, you, you talked about the 15 minute city, for example. And do, do you have maybe another example in mind? I, I don't know in the field of uh, urban policy, uh, economics, business, or energy. Yeah, that's not an easy question, but uh... I mean, autonomous driving has is, is I think inducing quite some systemic change, and there's still some some ways we could turn it one way or another. If one somehow manages to get pooled driving, um, that could actually be very helpful. If it goes to individualized transportation more and more, that that would be another uh, way different development, and that's fundamentally AI driven, obviously. Yeah, I would I would add on this that so the 15 minute city is really about trying to restructure um, the urban form and the urban activities in a way that people don't need to travel that much. But uh, yeah, there will still be a need for for traveling around by car and or by other means of transportation, but most likely cars are not gonna go away now and and we Still, I mean, they're, they're still useful in a way. And so there are many um, approaches that include autonomous vehicle, but also all sort of algorithms either to do pool share and mobility or also to enable to reduce the number of cars that people are using. So reduce car ownership in a way that um, you have a smart allocation that it's easy for everyone to pick up a car here and go somewhere else and um, not have this car that's lying around in the, in the streets for 90% of their time that are owned by someone that doesn't need it all the time. So just to make some smarter allocation of resources so that we get more space on the street, that we uh, reduce the emissions that are uh, linked to building more cars and et cetera. So um, I think there are a lot of systemic changes that can happen in the urban transportation sector uh, that can be helped a little bit by AI and all, but mostly a lot by policymaking. Completely, completely agree. Thanks a lot, really, uh, Lynn and Nicola, for this fascinating session, uh, for this amazing presentation and taking the time to, to answer all the questions. It was really great to have you uh, uh, for, for this lecture. Actually, uh, next lecture will be next week, and we are going to talk about urban economics and climate change to focus on this policy recommendation part you are talking about, which is so important. We will also have another link to the lecture in the meantime, Friday, uh, with Michael Batty. Uh, but uh, uh, complexity and urban uh, data. And um, yes, yeah, so that's the end of, the, of this lecture. If some of you want to stay in the room to discuss it, you are more than welcome. And for the others, see you Friday, actually, Friday. Thanks. Bye, Nicole. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.